Hello, my name is Michael Dungochen, and today I want to take a little bit of time to explore the concept of framing and to explain why it is that I think it's so important um, in British parliamentary debating and why it can be such a differentiating skill in that game. So to start with, what do I mean by framing? I think lots of people mean different things by this word. The definition I want to use is framing is the process of explaining why it is that an argument matters in the context of the debate in question. So you'll spend a lot of time explaining why an argument is true. I think framing is the component of your argumentation that explains why it is that that argument matters. Again, lots of different definitions. This is just the one that we'll be working under for the purposes uh, of this brief chat. Now, when you think about framing, I think it's, it's useful to conceptualize of any argument as existing on a two-dimensional plane, where the x-axis is how true an argument is, and the y-axis is how important an argument is. Now, if an argument is 100% true, but 0% important, it's not going to weigh in a judge's assessment around. In the same way, if an argument is 0% uh, true, but 100% important, the judge really isn't going to buy it. So in that way, by thinking about arguments as existing on this two-dimensional plane, where the axes are the truth and importance of an argument, we see pretty quickly that it is as important to explain why an argument matters as it is to explain why an argument is true. And this is where I think the real uh, differentiation that good framing can offer you comes from. Because I think most people spend most of their time explaining why an argument is true. Um, but, but that's just as important as going through the effort of explaining why an argument's important. So if you can take a step back and apply the same effort and argumentative rigor and thoughtfulness to explaining the importance of your claims, as you take when explaining their veracity, then I think you're going to be in a really good place um, to do something in debating that other people are not doing, and therefore to uh, advance yourself. Now, I think it's important when thinking about framing uh, to remember that not every issue is worthy of framing. I think every argument should have some framing, and you know, if you can't explain why an argument is important, then why are you making it? But I do think not every issue should be uh, raised up as important in a round. Let's take one example. Suppose you were to have a motion about providing amnesties to illegal immigrants. Now, on proposition, you're going to want to spend a lot of time drumming up pathos um, for illegal immigrants and their plight. But I think, especially in, in, in BP debating, where you know there are large numbers of people who are pretty liberal, I don't think many op opposition teams necessarily are going to contest that claim. What I think they are going to do is explain why actually the, the backlash and sense of resentment that uh, an amnesty might give rise to would actually lead to worse treatment for and worse quality of life for uh, illegal immigrants over the long run. So when you're framing your argument then, spending a lot of time building up this sense of pathos around illegal immigrants isn't really going to advance you in the round because your opponents are going to agree that that pathos is there, but just say, you know what, we think uh, we can alleviate their suffering better by not doing this policy. So focus your framing then on issues that are actually being contested in the round, that are live in the round. One good way of doing that might be to explain in this debate, for example, why amnesty is a precondition to having a normal social and economic life, which in turn is a precondition for building up the sense of esteem towards illegal immigrants that's ultimately necessary for them to have the good quality of life that opposition are worried might get taken away by a backlash, right? So in that way, you're explaining why the benefits the policy offers are actually a necessary precondition to overcoming the hatred that your opponents are so bothered about. That's a smart way of framing and explaining why it is that your argument matters than the other sides. So with, with that laid out, I'm now going to go and talk a little bit about what good framing uh, looks like. I'm going to start by saying what I think good framing can look like, but more often than not doesn't look like, and that is stories. I think people think a lot about framing as, you know, a story I tell at the beginning of my point, you know, a little narrative, and uh, basically a glorified example um, at the beginning of the point that has a bit of rhetoric and a bit of fluff around it. 
Um, and that's how the, an argument gets ascribed importance. And, and by and large, I think for a thoughtful, rational judge, that won't be the case. Now, that's not to say that stories don't have any value. Of course, they can really concretize an argument and can hammer home its impact. But I think we all seriously overestimate our skills as wordsmiths and our ability to make those stories stick versus just and this is the, the second form of framing that I'm, I'm going to pitch to you a little bit harder, just being very comparative in explaining why a particular argument matters more than, you know, whatever argument it is from the other side that you want to outweigh with it. So this is the second form of framing that I want to talk about, not stories, which, which can be useful, but I don't think often are necessarily that useful, but just explaining why, look, argument X outweighs argument Y because it affects more people or it affects a, a more important group uh, or because um, it, it impacts the premise upon which argument Y rests or, or something of that sort. So being as comparative as possible in the way that you do your framing and as explicitly so, I think is a really good way to move forward. Now, a second question you might have is, you know, look, what does framing look like, which we've answered? Where should framing live in your speech? Well, I think very often there's a temptation to just put the framing at the beginning of the speech. And that is a good place for it to go. You know, unfortunately, judges do not have uniform uh, attention spans. And often they will be paying the most attention during the first 30 seconds of your speech. So if you want to focus them on a key idea in the round, great time to do it is that first 30 seconds. So absolutely, framing does live at the beginning of the speech, but it's universal. Every single point should have framing. And this comes back to what I was saying about my two-dimensional grid at the beginning. You know, if, if the importance of every argument is is as vital as explaining why that argument is true, then you should have time explaining why every single argument is important, in addition to time explaining why every single argument is true. So make sure that every single point has a bit of framing at the beginning, explaining why you're saying what you're saying, why you're bothering to waste your breath explaining this point. That's a very important thing to have. Similarly, framing can live in rebuttal. It should live in rebuttal. Not everything your opponent says will be false, right? You know, there is a grain of truth to them, even though they stand on the other side of the debate. The, the reality is an awful lot of what they say might be true, but might not be important. So I'm ensuring that this technique of focusing on the importance of argument, that y-axis in our two-dimensional grid, is as important in your rebuttal as, you know, just pointing out that they're wrong about this fact or the premise here is faulty or, you know, the more conventional modes of rebuttal um, that you might be used to. OK, so with that laid out, let's now move on to different types of framing. Uh, the way I sort of intend this to function is almost a toolkit for you. I'm not going to give an exhaustive list of every type of framing you'll ever see, but I'm going to highlight some of the most common ones so that when you think of an argument or you're trying to think of an argument, you know, these techniques can come to the top of your mind and you can execute on them. So I'm going to come up with three broad categories of framing. The first is around the consequences of an argument. The second is around uh, the moral framework behind an argument. And the final one is just around the debate itself and the function of that argument within the debate. So, to the first, the consequences of a particular argument. Three different ways that you might frame around this. The first is around the quantity of people impacted by a particular argument. And I think this is, this is kind of basic, right? But it's also easy to forget. You know, we're often uh, too focused on, you know, spinning a... a a narrative that really pulls on the heartstrings to just think about, look, how many people are impacted by this? You know, ultimately, I don't care how uh, needy and worthy you make your stakeholders sound. You know, ultimately, there are 10 times as many on this side of the house, there are on that side of the house, and that ought to weigh up. And I think people need to be more explicit about bringing that to the table. Um, how might you do this? Well, you know, here's one example. In debates where, you know, you might have an economic argument on one side versus a narrative-y, feelings-y argument on the other side, taking the time to explain, guys, this is what $10 billion means in human terms, is definitely worth it. You're explaining why that quantity of impact um, really is there. Similarly, explaining why, you know what, even if they have identified the most vulnerable stakeholder on their side of the house, we're talking about tens of thousands of times as many people, right, is a valuable way of explaining why, you know what, they've, you know, made a stab at us by focusing on the group they've chosen to by going the intersection of the intersection of the intersection of finding the most vulnerable stakeholder in the round. But you know what? We can parry that blow because ultimately we're dealing with the median case. We're dealing with the overwhelming majority here. And I think being upfront about that and being numerically comparative around quantities can be a great way of explaining why your arguments are important. So that's technique number one. Technique number two um, is framing around the vulnerability, and I've already intimated this, of a particular group in question, about how worthy they are of our moral attention 
and concern. And really zooming in on that, and this is perhaps somewhere where sort of narrative, painting a picture kind of framing can be helpful, is, is very important. Explaining why this is the group that should be the focus of our moral caring, because they're the most downtrodden um, uh, uh, and the ones who, who, who we need to help, right? And, and putting your opponent in a position where your argument is so morally compelling that you know what, they're not going to contest that these are the people we should be caring about. They're just going to claim they have a better way of getting there. Therefore, taking their approach from a two-dimensional attack on you to just a one-dimensional one can be a great strategy. So focusing on the vulnerability of a particular group is another way to frame around an argument consequentially. The third way um, is a little bit more subtle, and that is framing around the depth of impact an argument has on a particular group. So this is not saying in absolute terms this group is more vulnerable than that group. It's just saying, look, in absolute terms, if we think about the comparison in this debate, you know what? This policy might impact that group, but they're already being impacted in that way anyway. So the marginal impact is pretty low versus actually this group um, uh, was not impacted by this at all and now is tremendously impacted. So the marginal impact is very high. So those sorts of comparisons, looking at what there was in the world without this policy, what there is in the world with this policy, and explaining which group has the deeper impact is, again, a valuable way of framing your argument. So those are three techniques of framing around the consequences of a particular argument. Now let's talk about moral frameworks. Now, you might think of this as framing quote-unquote principled arguments, but I'm trying my best not to use that term because I think it's something of a misnomer. You know, all arguments have a moral principle underpinning them. A purely utilitarian argument has a moral principle underpinning it. You know, utilitarianism, somewhat unsurprisingly. So the reality is, seeing this distinction between a principled and a practical argument it kind of doesn't make sense, especially when you bear in mind that every single moral principle you talk about, you know, does require X to do Y to trigger that moral principle, right? Each moral principle is relative to a particular action, describing the morality of that particular action. So saying some arguments are just about consequences and some arguments are just about principles kind of misses the point because all arguments are about both. Now, for some arguments, the principle framework may require more truth, proof than others because the other side is less likely to concede it. It may require more effort, so the majority of your work may be on the principle, but you want to remember that that argument still has a practical component, even if you choose not to acknowledge it, and that is somewhere where you can be contested, so you certainly want to be aware of it. Now, with that little diatribe over, this type of framing is around the moral duty in question, or the moral principle in question. So, you know, for example, in a debate which touches on something analogous to self-defense, um, you know, one of the great things about self-defense is your right to self-defense um, I think the way many people conceptualize it exists independent of the consequences of it, right? You know, even if your self-defense is unsuccessful or, you know what, you botch it and end up injuring someone, I think most uh, jurisdictions would still give you that right to self-defense because they'd say, you know what, when push comes to shove, when a human being is in a situation where they absolutely can't defend themselves, then it behoves the dignity of the human condition that they have some ability to put up a fight and secure their rights. And, you know, what that right exists independent of whether they're successful in doing so, independent of whether um, they do so in an artful, clean way, because at the end of the day, every human being has a right to self-defense. That's not true in all cases, but certainly I think it's a morally intuitive claim you can make, and it's powerful in the context of a debate, because when everyone else is focusing on consequences, you can be someone who says, you know what, guys, consequences alone, just added up in a utilitarian sense, greatest good for the greatest number, is not the key metric upon which the debate should be adjudicated, and this is why, because of the fact that your right to self-defense exists independent of the consequences. Now, this is a great way of arguing, but when you're explaining the importance of your argument, what you really want to explain is why the moral duty or moral right that you are alluding to outweighs the other competing moral duties in the round, like the minimization of consequential harm. You know, I have a moral duty to give this workshop, but because I promised to do so, but to be clear, yeah, if my mother had just died, I think my moral duty to give this workshop would be superseded by moral moral duty uh, to mourn my mother, right? So just because a moral duty exists doesn't mean that it's the compelling moral obligation and that it should be the determinant of your behavior. So in the same way, explaining why a principled argument outweighs practicalities or why a particular moral obligation or particular moral framework is the determinant one in the context of the debate is an absolutely vital component of your framing of that argument. Now, taking a step back, how might you do this? You know, I think the structure of any moral argument we make in study in seven minutes is ultimately it, it kind of pulls out our moral intuitions. So, you know, at no point does, I think, a moral argument start with, a, 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 like, an obviously uh, incontrovertible premise and then 
uh, you sort of start with that premise and analytically build up to a whole moral worldview. You know, one proves utilitarianism in a seven minute uh, speech. But rather, you know, it kind of starts with a moral intuition, right? An intuition about how people should act and explains why that intuition in this particular context is the dominant one in how we should look at morality. So, and the way that's often done is by means of a thought experiment or an analogy that makes that intuition real to us in a context that isn't the one of the debate, but a similar one, and thereby says, you know what, if in this context, this is the determinant moral intu intuition, we well, you know what, this context is pretty similar to the one we're debating, so here too it should be the, de the, the determinant moral intuition. Now, obviously, you run the risk that your opponent calls your bluff, right, or they find a flaw in your analogy, but ultimately, if you're trying to take a moral intuition that starts... Uh, in a different place from the one you're debating, which I'd suggest is a good idea, otherwise you're going to have a purely circular argument, and explaining why it still operates in the place where you're debating, you know, an analogy is really the only way you're going to thread that needle. So think about moral analogies and how to explain why the moral principle you're, gu you're gunning for is determinant in a similar context to this one, and why that similarity means that it carries across the determinant moral framework in the context in question. You'll see lots of examples of this. You know, if I take one example, um, you know, there's an argument made about abortion um, in a lot of debates explaining why uh, abortion can be a form of self-defense, you know, really analogizing um, abortion to uh, more conventional forms of self-defense or things that we would, you know, more linearly think of as self-defense is, is how you make that moral intuition stick in the context of this round and then explaining why self-defense outweighs uh, just pure consequences or any other consideration, right? The fact that, for example, you can defend yourself and it can still be fatal for the other person and that's still legal and, and something that morally many societies accept um, uh, is how you explain why that is the determinant moral intuition in this case. So use the analogy to explain that uh, determining factor. Finally, um, let's talk about uh, framing around the debating question. And there are really two techniques I want to highlight. The first is framing around a key question in the debate, and the second is framing around uniqueness or inherency to the debate. So starting with a key question, then let's take a very, uh, you know, slightly uh, old motion. Um, this House believes uh, that third parties should not be involved in the financing of civil litigation, right? So, so you know, you want to sue someone? Great. You've got to pay for it yourself. They can't have a third party financier coming in and providing you with that money. You know, if you think about this debate, really, on op, you're going to want to spend all your time talking about uh, civil rights litigation and why often uh, minority groups don't have the money to finance these litigations themselves, so why third party funding is vitally important. And on gov, you're going to want to spend some time talking about how often special interest groups can use third party litigation funding as a means to shut down on dissent, um, to just gum up the system with all sorts of frivolous litigation. Um, you know, in short, I want to talk about the good case of this thing, Gov want to talk about the bad case of this thing. Now, if you're closing Gov, say, you know, you might be able to add to that by identifying a further set of cases or some fancy moral principle or whatever. But you know what? Your best bet might be just explaining why the bad set of cases predominate over the good set of cases, right? And therefore, when you're explaining why your argument is important, you're not going to be saying, well, the impact of this argument is this, because it doesn't have an impact. It's not a claim that starts premise, link, 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 conclusion, impact. It's a claim that says, this set of cases is the preponderance of cases or the cases we should focus on in this round. So explaining why your argument answers a key question in a round can be a way of explaining why that argument is debate winning, you know, independent of moral framework or weighing up impacts or whatever. So find arguments that answer key questions in the debate, explain what those questions are, why the argument answers it, and why that question is so key to determine the outcome of the round, and you've just explained why your argument was debate winning. Right. And, you know, if, if you did, if you actually explain the argument, then you should win the debate. Now, um, the second form of framing that I want to highlight around the debating question is around the idea of inherency or uniqueness, explaining why, you know what, this is the only way we can achieve this impact. Whereas, you know what, the other side's impacts or our openings impacts, they can be achieved by all manner of different ways, right, that aren't inherent to this motion, that are just other policies you might be able to implement. So explaining why your claim is inherent to this specific policy or this specific motion and everyone else's isn't can be a great way of explaining why, in the context of this motion, we should care more about your claim than that of other people's. Now, you don't want to be too subtle. You don't want to sort of counterprop for the other side from closing or whatever. 
but it's completely all right to explain why your argument has greater inherency than the other side's argument. And ultimately, in a debate where there aren't many other ways to adjudicate the importance of a claim, that can really be the determining factor in adjudicating who made the argument was most relevant and therefore most compelling in the context of the round. So your toolkit, uh, framing around the consequences, uh, quantity of impact, vulnerability of impact, depth of impact, um, uh, framing around uh, the moral framework in question, why this is the compelling moral duty, and then finally framing around the question in the round, um, or the debate itself, whether that's a specific question that's determinant of the outcome of the debate, or why an argument is inherent or unique to that debate. Finally, just a couple of very brief comments on how to use framing uh, in the context of a debate. Just two very simple tips. The first is rebut it, right? If we accept the premise um, that Framing, explaining why an argument is important, is as important as explaining why an argument is true, then it deserves equally as much rebuttal. In fact, I'd make the claim that it might actually desire, need more rebuttal for the simple reason that, you know, your opponents aren't always talking total nonsense. In many cases, they will be making arguments that are true. The real question is, are they important in the context of this debate? So spending all your time trying to explain why they're fibbing about what they claim happens, you know, is a waste of time in some contexts, not all contexts, but some contexts, whereas explaining why, actually, you know what, they might be right, but it doesn't matter, is often the best and most reasonable way of responding to what your opponent is saying. So make sure that you rebut framing of the other side, and that you rebut with framing to the other side, so that you're not just winning the debate on they're all just lying all the time, but you're also winning the debate on, you know what, even if you do believe what they've said, and you can still rebut that, at the end of the day, it's not what you should make your decision on when adjudicating this debate. So please, you know, incorporate framing into your rebuttal and make sure that you rebut the framing of the other side because no good giving them a cheeky win just because they put some framing in which you didn't bother to rebut, which focused the debate on an issue that weren't, wasn't your issue, so to speak. Um, finally, you know, I think, and this again comes back to what I said earlier about stories versus just being very comparative in your framing, be as explicit as you possibly can. I think... You know, it feels a bit intellectually, you know, presumptuous, I suppose, in, in what can be a very complex debate to see, say, this issue is the most important and it's more important than this tremendously broad and deep and important issue for this reason, you know, which I can articulate in a sentence, right? That feels intellectually quite glib. So I think often because of that glibness, people are reticent about just being very explicit when they frame because they feel that it, it's almost cheapening. Don't. Be as explicit as you possibly can. Be as comparative as you possibly can. Explain why argument X outweighs argument Y. It doesn't matter if the reason sounds trite. So long as it's clearly explained and logical, that is something for the judge to adjudicate that clash on. And you know what? They're not a good judge if they adjudicate it on anything else. Because if the debate has offered a clear, logical explanation of why a particular argument is more important than another one, the judge should go with what was actually said in the round, not their previous preconceptions. It's when you leave a gap Right? When you don't explain comparatively, explicitly, why one argument outweighs another, that, you know what, the judge's intuition and their view has to creep into the round to some extent, or their impression of what the average intelligent voter thinks has to creep into the round to some extent, because you know what? There was no other way for them to adjudicate that clash. So be as explicit and clear as you possibly can. Make sure that your framing is maximally comparative and that you're always explaining why argument X outweighs argument Y, leaving nothing to the judge's imagination, because as we all know, judges' imaginations can be pretty capricious. So, thank you very much for listening. If you take nothing else away from this, it's that proving that an argument is important is as important as proving that it's true, and you should really direct as much energy and rigour and attention to detail to that as you do to making an argument in the conventional sense. So thank you very much for listening, uh, and goodbye.